Jordans in Fall River were quite wealthy. And even though Andrew was honestly at that time among the poorer Borden relations, he still had what was considered quite a lot of wealth. At the time of his death, he was worth between uh, what, 500, 350 and $500,000. Today's money, that's about $12 million. Oh, yeah. You could, and, and you know what? You could live the rest of your life on $12 million back then. Trust me. Oh, yeah. E- even on a he couple hundred he, thousand, you could. Yeah, yeah. He could have lived very well on that $500,000 that he was worth. He just didn't. <laughs> he chose not to. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Hey, Go, James, you have some questions there. Yeah. Uh, hey, Colleen, um, this is James. Was Hi. There, did the, how you doing? Um, didn't two other family board member family members die on that land? Did they live next door? Wasn't didn't that happen too? Be, prior to the murders of the mother and father, you are absolutely correct, sir. That happened in. Let's see. It was there. I am. It happened in eighteen forty eight. There was a house right next door to the Borden house. At the time, it kind of abutted their property. Um, and a gentleman by the name of Ladawick Borden lived there. Now, Ladawick was the brother to Abraham Bowen Borden, who was Andrew Borden's father. So Ladawick was Andrew Borden's great uncle. And, uh, or uncle, pardon me. And uh, he had a, a wife, Eliza, and she had three children. I only know the names of two of them. There was Eliza and Holder. She probably was suffering from postpartum depression when this happened uh, because she had just had the third child. It was still an infant. When she threw all three of the children down a well that was on the property, two of them did die um, and one survived. And then, but she went back into the house and cut her own throat with Ladowick's razor. And this was literally right across, right next door to the Borden home where these murders occurred. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot to go on for a family and the land. It, I, I mean, I, I thought that's what happened. I Because I, I, I used to live right around the corner there. I think it's Spring Street, maybe. Is there oh, a Spring sure. Street close by? Yeah, it, this is like yeah, 30 years ago. Yeah, it's very close. Yeah, I thought I had the memory right, but I had to. I could have been wrong, but I know it was been a long time since I was there. But anyway, I I can remember reading stuff about that a long time ago, and it, it, there was also um, they thought maybe there was curse on the land or the land's haunted. But that that is a lot of stuff to go on on that land if you think about it to one family. It is. It is um, yeah. particularly yeah because of the you know, the violence and the bloodshed. But you are right. There are some people who think that um, much of the land around Fall River and the surrounding area is kind of cursed. There are a lot of people <laughs> yeah. who believe that. Uh, yeah. i got to ask you a question because I know you've been in that house several, many times, way more than I have. Is, sure. Do you think, it's, yeah, you think it's possible, like Lizzie was, to be in that house uh, – why two axe murders were taking place within probably an hour of each other and not hear nothing? (laughs) Well, I'll tell you what. I don't (laughs) think that it's possible. Um, First of all, if it was one killer, that person would have had to have hidden somewhere on the property between 9.30 when Abby Borden was killed and 11 o'clock when Mr. Borden was killed. Now, for the second murder, Lizzie said she was outside in the barn eating pears, and she came in and found her father dead on the sofa. And at that point, <laughs> once she raised the alarm about that, they didn't know anything about Abby being upstairs for an hour and a half prior to Mr. Borden being murdered until Lizzie said something akin to, you know, I think, oh, somebody asked her where Mrs. Borden was, one of the policemen. And she said, I don't know, but I think I heard her go upstairs. And so she sent the maid and a family friend upstairs, and they found Mrs. Borden's body. But here's the thing, and, and I'm not really popular with this. I actually believe that there were two murderers, and I don't believe that Lizzie was either one of them. Oh, really? Okay. Because yeah, um, I, think- I, I did a lot of research, and, and one of the things came up that Lizzie bought – a dress that was a couple sizes too big prior to that, and then wasn't 
her father going to change the will the next day where Lizzie was kind of cut out, or or is that wrong? Um, it's rumored that that was a thing that was going to happen. We don't know whether or not it actually ever did. There was no will ever found on the property. Oh, interesting. They did look okay. for it. They looked for it. But with no will, the inheritance went right to, to Emma Lizzie. and Lizzie. <laughs> yeah. Now, I want to jump in here. Uh, mm-hmm. Why do you feel there was two murders? Uh, g- give us your gut feeling why you feel that way. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um... <laughs> I'll try not to get too complicated. Get complicated because, you know, that, that's what makes it interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, there are some fairly strong rumors, and, and I'm not sure I'm going to try to be as PC about this as I can, that there may have been uh, an inappropriate relationship there between uh, Andrew and Lizzie. Yeah. So what I think happened is I believe that Lizzie possibly told someone about this. It may have been her uncle John, who literally showed up at the house the night before the murders to stay overnight, like out of the blue, just showed up knocking at the door, no suitcase, no toothbrush. Hi, I'm staying overnight. And I wonder if maybe he didn't kill Abby and hire someone to come in and kill Andrew because he had an ironclad alibi for the murders. What was his alibi? His alibi was that he had left the house with Mr. Borden, and he was around, uh, he was around town on uh, the trolleys and a couple of horse-drawn cars visiting family members. Um, but see, his alibi is a little bit too, like, pat, patent for me. He says that he remembered the, uh, the conductor On the train, he asked the conductor's first name. He remembered that. He was able to tell the police the number on the badge that the conductor wore on his hat. And he remembered that there were six Irish Catholic priests on the train, and they offered to vouch for him. (laughs) That's uh, pretty good. his, His alibi was just so clean and tight. But he had time. He would have had time to go back to the house after he left with Mr. Borden and murder Abby and leave again to do all of that running around. Now, what was he, what was his profession? Was he wealthy too, uh, or semi wealthy or, or, or was he no. the one that was the black sheep in the family? It didn't have anything. Um, no, he had, he did have some wealth. He had been born in fall river and eventually moved out to, uh, Iowa and then just a couple of months before the murders, he came back to Fall River and was living in uh, the town right across, like right over from us, Westport. Well, he did uh, like horse trading and things like that. So he had some wealth. He had also been a butcher by trade, though. One of the jobs that he had had when he was younger was he was a butcher. It's hmm. interesting right there because, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, he, I'm a butcher and... <laughs> And then hacking. Yep. How, I got to ask a gross question here. Okay. It's all right. Okay. Sure. When, when these two, you know, the husband and wife were chopped up with, mm-hmm. the, how bad were they chopped up? I mean, have you ever seen pictures of their uh, bodies have. or anything? Yeah, I have. Um, I've seen the crime scene photos and I've seen uh, autopsy photos of both of them. Um, Mr. Borden received about 11 blows to the front left side of his face. The left side of his face was completely missing. His nose was gone. His left eye was hanging out of the socket onto his cheekbone. She received 19 blows to the back of the head. Um, She wore what they called a hair fall. It was kind of like extensions that some girls wear these days. And that literally was sliced right off of her head. Yeah, I got a funny there, feeling. I got a funny feeling. <laughs> I got a funny feeling her brain was probably not in her head either after that many whacks. Um, I don't know for sure. There were bit well, actually I do. Um, the autopsy report I believe for her does state that there was blood and brain matter kind of kind of on the wall and the bureau and maybe the bed. Why she was murdered too? in between um, the bed and the bureau in the guest room. Interesting. 
I just how 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 big was Lizzie? How tall was she? Was she muscular? Did uh, I mean uh, was she or uh, a lady like? Nope. She was uh, well. Let's see. Lizzie was five four. She was actually two inches taller than me, um, but she only weighed about one hundred and thirty five pounds at the time of the murders. Now, here is the thing you have to keep in mind: the average hatchet, which is what they assumed the murder weapon to be because of the wounds in the heads. The average hatchet weighs between, oh, two and three pounds. Some of them can weigh up to, you know, four or five. And from what I understand, it only takes about five pounds of pressure and torque to crush the human skull. So she very easily could have done this. The only thing that she would have had a problem with is that Andrew Borden was quite tall. He was lying down for a nap. So if she was the one that killed him, she had no problems because he was laying at a much lower and more convenient um, level for her to be able to swing the hatchet. Now, there was rumors that she was actually, now, you can dispel it, but I remember when I was a kid, you know, the the, the famous song about her, you know, there was rumors that she was out practicing with with a hatchet uh, before this happened, and people supposedly saw it. Now, is the, do you know if that was true or just you know how rumors get spread? Yeah, I have never heard a single thing about it, so I'm going to go with it's not true. I'm going to go with it's not true because I have been well, I've been studying the case for about forty five years. I think I might have heard it. I know there was. Um, about a year after the murders occurred, a hatchet was found on the, um, on the roof of the garage that was, that belonged to the house on the next street over. So this garage abutted the Borden property and they did find a hatchet up there. A couple of small boys found it and there was guilting on the hatchet. Now there was a rumor that she had stolen a hatchet from one of the stores, that she had used a new hatchet. So they found this this hatchet up on this roof, and there was silver gilting still on it. Now, that's shiny, shiny stuff like paint that they would put on hatchets to make them look nice, but it flaked off really easily. It would come off within, like, the first, first or second use. Mrs. Borden, according to her autopsy report, had a fleck of silver gilt, in one of her wounds. So it's entirely possible that that hatchet was the one that killed her, but they couldn't do anything about it. They couldn't reopen the case. Lizzie had already been acquitted, and you can't try someone for the same murder twice. Interesting. Now, we're going to have to go on break. I'm going to put you on mute, so if you want to get a cup of coffee or something, you know, to drink, go ahead. We'll be back in three minutes. You're listening to Colleen. You're listening to me, Gary, and James on Night Dreams Talk Radio. You thirst for some significance of the both dimensional kind. You enter a realm of spirit of sight and sound and mind. Your radio is a cosmic doorway and your psyche begins to spark. When you tune in to Gary and the Sun and Night Dreams After Dark. (laughs) 